This is who I was, but it's definitely not who I am. Check it out, people. You want a story where two of the top 1% motorcycle clubs in America go at it on a casino floor? Not Laughlin. How about a story where one of those presidents actually takes out another president from a rival club? How about a story where shots ring out in a massive funeral for one of the most beloved members of the Hells Angels? You want betraying, snitching, RICO trials? Well, this story has every single bit of that and a lot more. September 23rd, 2011. There's a town in Nevada called Sparks. Sparks is basically connected to Reno, kind of like a suburb. It's two towns that ended up connecting together, basically. Now, motorcycles from around the country, they always show up every time in September to Street Vibrations. It's a festival, it's a motorcycle festival. It's put on annually in Sparks, Nevada. So many different types of clubs show up at these things, as we know. You got your regular run-of-the-mill type of clubs, and then you have your, for the lack of a better term, outlaw motorcycle clubs, or one percenter clubs is basically what they're called. Now, two of those clubs, they were in attendance at the festival in 2011. That's the Vagos and the Hells Angels. Now, in Sparks, Nevada, there is a little casino. It's called the Sparks Nugget Hotel and Casino. So a brawl breaks out on the floor of this casino between the two groups. By the end of this, Ernesto Romeo Gonzalez is seen shooting Jeffrey Jethro Pettigrew in his back. Now, Romeo Gonzalez, he's the 55-year-old president of the Nicaragua chapter of the Vagos. Jethro Pettigrew, well, he's the 51-year-old San Jose Hells Angels charter president. Jethro, by far, was one of, if not the most popular Hells Angel at this time. Everybody loved Jethro. He is definitely one of the top five Hells Angels in the world when all of this goes down. When the police arrived... Well, they found Jethro lying on the floor. Sadly, his wounds, they were fatal. And at 51 years old, Jethro passed away. Not only that, two Vagos. 45-year-old Leo Crusher Ramirez and 28-year-old Diego Boo Garcia were both in the hospital suffering wounds. On top of that, 36-year-old Hells Angel Cesar Villagrana was arrested when he was seen pulling the heat and using it on the casino floor. But why did this happen? How could rivals from two separate MCs end up in a firefight in the middle of a casino floor again in Nevada? The footage shows that there's a Vago. He's the vice president of the LA chapter of the Vagos. Gary Jabbers Rudnick is over there and he's kind of, I guess taunting would be the word. He's messing with Jethro. Now Jethro was trying to be cool. Literally, he just has his charter that's left in town, and there's like 500 Vagos in town at the time. Jethro's not looking for problems. He's just down there gambling, having himself a beer, minding his business. Jabbers, he's, I guess, one of those Rudy Poos. So he's over there. He's messing with him. He knows he's got the numbers. And Jethro kept telling him, hey, man, I'm just trying to drink my beer, play a little bit of these slots. I'm minding my business. You have a good day. Other higher ranking Vagos from the Nomads show up, they see what's going on, and they basically tell Jabbers, hey man, chill, shut the up, and go over there. You're starting something, this dude, we all know who he is, he's one of the more popular Hells Angels, this ain't the time and place for something stupid like this. Now Jabbers, he would walk away, but then he would come back. They would tell him to get beat, he would leave, he would come back, always just trying to be that drunk guy who's like, why did you touch me? Why did you touch me? By touching him, what had actually happened is Jabbers had come up trying to pick a fight with Jethro and Jethro had just put his hand on Jabbers' back very lightly like, hey bud, I don't have an issue. At one point, you can see Jethro and his vice president, Bob, get up, go walking to a different area, just trying to get away from the stupidity of what Jabbers was doing. So the Vagos nomads, who were obviously good dudes who were schooled well, they said, hey, Jabbers, over there now, this is a dead issue, as they sit and they talk. They talk to Jethro, they talk to Bob. Hey, man, everything's cool. I'm sorry. 
you know, he's just one of them dudes. Sometimes he can't handle his drinks. There's no problems here. It's all cool. Now the nomads, they then try to call the international president of the Bagos, who goes by Tata. Tata didn't pick up his phone. So then they tried to call the national nomad president who did answer his phone. He goes by Dragon Man. So these Vagos, Dragon Man says, hey, come upstairs. They chop it up. They tell him what's going on, how Jabbers is acting. And the national nomad president says, okay, let's get back down there and make sure everything's cool. They go down there. They pull their rank on Jabbers, tell him to settle his ass down. And for about 40 minutes, everything was good. Then Jethro gets up. He goes walking across basically the casino out of the bar area where Jabbers is playing on the slots. Now Jethro didn't go walking by Jabbers. He was just walking through the casino. Jabbers saw him and immediately tried to call Jethro over to him. Now in this world, you can't be doing stuff like that. If you've had a beef with somebody, to call another grown man over to you is a major disrespect. Like I said, Jethro was only there with his charter. He had even sent his sergeant at arms, Steve Ruiz, known as San Jose Steve, up to the room, basically on a probation. I don't know what that was about. I've never gotten answers about that, but it is seen that he does send him up to the room. Now, right before Jabbers called him over there on security, you could clearly see Jabbers put his gloves on. And not only that, another Vago, Diego Boo Garcia also puts his gloves on. Now, usually you see something like that in the bar. I know if I see it, I'm going to be like, hey, something's about to go down. These dudes putting their gloves on. At that point, you can also see Ernesto Romeo Gonzalez put his drink down as he's steadily watching the interaction that's about to happen between Jethro and Jabbers. Now, this is the breaking point. Jethro had already tried to be cool. Jabbers continued to run his mouth. The rest of the Vagos saw what was going on, tried to calm it down, but nothing, Jabbers was just in that kind of mood, I guess. So Jethro walks over to Jabbers once he, hey, come here. As Jabbers goes to open his mouth, Jethro fires on him. Boom, hits him, puts him down, it's on. Now seeing this, Boo Garcia, he comes running over, a couple of other Vagos come running over. They try to jump on Bob and jump on Jethro. Well, Jethro, he's not a young man, 51 years old. He's been in the game a long time. He's lost a leg, so he has a prosthetic leg. Lost that in a motorcycle accident when he was hit by a car. Jethro's not about to get jumped by however many Vagos decide to come over there and kick him. Well, he pulls his heat out, pops one right into Boo Garcia's leg, and at that point, Hells Angel Caesar Villagrano, he sees this going on, pulls his heat, and starts just popping off at everybody too. He hits another Vago in the stomach as he's actually walking out of the bathroom. Now there's one issue. The Nicaragua president, Romeo, his cousin is Boo Garcia, who just got hit in the leg. So Romeo starts plotting on how he can get around to Jethro. As he's kind of walking the flank to get around Jethro without being seen, he comes up and he sees Jethro and Villagrano, they're feeding a Vago. Vago Robert Wiggins is on the ground. They're boots to head, man. They are blasting off on this poor guy. And at that point, Romeo pulls his heat and he hits Jethro in the back four times. Now, all told, this melee only lasted about two minutes. But by the end of it, one of the most beloved Hells Angels presidents was laying on the floor, gone. Two Vagos were on their way to the hospital. Another Hells Angel was arrested for having a stolen weapon. And the world was about to fall apart all around all of it. Police actually rode ATVs into the casino, onto the casino floor to stop this melee. Now, if that's not some Hollywood style cowboy cop stuff, but hey, they got it under control. Or maybe they didn't and everybody was just out of ammo. I don't know. Anyway, it happens, the fight stopped. Now, Romeo was able to get out of the casino and away from Sparks. Cops were looking for him for about a week. They actually found that he had a plane ticket booked to go to El Salvador. Now, they happened to find him in the Bay Area in a car. From what they said, 
And this is from the cops who knows. They said that he was relieved that it was the police because he thought it was gonna be the Hells Angels coming to get him. Now, because he tried to run, they set his bail super high, $2 million. You can't have plane tickets trying to leave the country and think you're, he's lucky he even had a bail to begin with. Now, a few hours later, the Hells Angels, they caught themselves a Vago sitting at a street light. They pulled up in a BMW and they blasted him in his stomach and drove off. Now that man lived, but this caused the mayor of Sparks to actually call for a state of emergency so that they could bring in and get more help. Basically, they were able to tap into state funds and state police forces by doing that. They set a curfew. They were on top of it as much as they could be for small town America that just had something crazy like this happen in it. Now, Romeo claimed that the entire incident was self-defense. He says, hey, they pulled first. They hit my cousin in the leg with one of those. And he said that when he came around the corner and saw them kicking one of his Vago brothers on the ground, that he thought they were kicking him so hard, there was no way he was going to survive it. He had to stop them. Now, all of the Vagos that were arrested on this, everybody, they held their mud. They did not talk and they were ready to go to trial on self-defense. Well, that all fell apart because one of the Vagos members finally flipped. They managed to flip LA Vice President Jabbers. The man who started this entire thing, the reason why Jethro is gone, the reason why Romeo is facing a life sentence is because Jabbers started this fight. And lo and behold, that's the same person who decides to roll on all of his brothers. Jabbers went and he told the police, hey, this was coordinated. This was an assassination plot that was carried out and called for by the very top of the Vagos organization. Basically, he said that they had had a meeting earlier in the day and earlier in the day, Tata and Dragon Man had told the Vagos they need to take Jethro out. Now, because of this, obviously the police and the, and the district attorneys, they had everything they needed to go ahead, move forward on charging Romeo because now his self-defense, one of his brothers is saying, hey, this was a planned hit. Now, kudos, kudos to Romeo. Romeo stood tall and took this thing all the way through to the box jury trial. He sat there as Jabbers testified, saying that it was an orchestrated hit by the Vagos. For his cooperation, Jabbers was supposed to get probation. But instead, the judge gave him two to seven years for conspiracy to commit murder. With a co-conspirator testifying against him, Romeo stood no chance in this trial. Now, he always stood by a story that this was no conspiracy or hit. This was a fight that got out of hand. He was stopping an active shooter in a casino, and he did what he had to do to stop it. Now, it took the jury only five hours to come back and find him guilty. When the jury came back that fast, the defense attorneys were actually surprised and happy because usually when they come back that fast, it's not guilty. Not in this case at all. They sifted through everything. They asked the judge multiple questions. Some of those questions, the judge actually declined to answer. But within that five hours, they came, they saw, they conquered. And Romeo, you're guilty for the murder of Jethro. So sentencing day comes. Romeo gets one to four for carrying a concealed weapon. Three to 13 years for discharging that weapon in an occupied structure. Two to eight years for conspiracy to commit murder. And then the big one, 20 to life for the murder of Jethro Pettigrew. Now, all four of those were to run concurrent. So basically, he's looking at 20 to life. But then the judge threw on the gang enhancement. The gang enhancement in this one actually got Romeo 8 to 20 more years after he was done serving his 20 to life. So in aggregate, Romeo Gonzalez was broke off with 28 to life. Now, of course, just like any defense attorney would, they said, hey, we're going to appeal this right away. The judge didn't do what they were supposed to. Now, for popping off on the casino floor and wounding one of the Vagos, Cesar Villagrana was also broke off with a little bit of time. He got 12 to 30 months for challenging to a fight that resulted in a death, and that was run consecutive with a 4 to 10. 
for battery with the use of a deadly weapon. So in aggregate, Villagrana, he got himself five to 12 and a half years. Now, last I heard, Caesar had gotten out of prison, has moved back, and he's the president of the San Jose Charter. Now, let's talk about the craziness of it all. Brokenhearted, shocked, awed, 4,000 people showed up to Jeffrey Jethro Pettigrew's funeral. 4,000 people. Now, the police and press, they were made to stay outside of the cemetery, outside of the fences, basically, but there were plainclothes officers in there. It's not like they were checking IDs to the funeral. Anybody who wanted to be there was allowed to be there. Obviously, that means the cops were going to be there, too. San Jose Charter Sergeant at Arms, San Jose Steve Ruiz, well, he delivered a eulogy for his downed president, for Jethro. After everybody has spoken on Jethro's behalf, everybody starts to kind of congregate out towards the parking lot. That's when everything went crazy. Now, multiple shots just rang out of nowhere at the cemetery. Nobody knows what's going on. They don't know if it's a rival that has come to actually shoot up the funeral. They don't know if it's just wild drunk motorcyclists popping off in the air out of frustration. What had actually happened? Well, a fight broke out between San Jose Steve Ruiz and Jethro Pettigrew's best friend. That best friend? Well, his name is Steve Mr. 187 Towson. Also used to be known as San Jose Steve when he was in the San Jose Charter with Jethro. Now, he's in the Santa Cruz Charter and he's their sergeant at arms. Now, Mr. 187, the dude's an ex-Marine, a pro boxer, and he's a bail bondsman. Mr. 187 also successfully sued the city because they had raided his house and popped three of his dogs on the way in. Now, Mr. 187, he goes to San Jose Steve and he confronts him. Why weren't you on the casino floor to protect him? It's your fault he's not here. You were supposed to be there. Now, don't mind the fact that San Jose Steve was basically told to go away by Jethro, his president. And he's going to do what he's told by his president. Mr. 187 also took offense to the fact that San Jose Steve was seen riding Jethro's bike shortly after Jethro was killed. Now, what had happened with that? Jethro's daughter donated the bike to the San Jose Charter because she thought that the brothers would want this bike as a memorial, basically. Here's his bike. She wanted them to enjoy it. So they each rode around on it. Mr. 187 thought that San Jose Steve had zero business being on that bike. Mr. 187 basically blamed San Jose Steve for the death of Jethro. So at the funeral, Mr. 187 finally comes across San Jose Steve. He starts yelling at the San Jose Charter. If you're not going to take his cut, I am. He wasn't there. He was supposed to be. From all accounts, Mr. 187 beat the bark right off of San Jose Steve. Now, that's not to say that San Jose Steve is not a tough guy in any means. Mr. 187 is legitimately, in everybody's words, one of the baddest dudes you're ever going to meet. Well, not only did he beat the bark off of him, he beat him unconscious and then continued to kick him in his head while he was down. That's a no-no in the club. You cannot hit a brother while he's down. He did it anyway. While he was unconscious, he also stripped him of his cut. He took his patch. Now, the rules, if you're a hell's angel, somebody takes your cut, you do what you got to to get that back. There is no way. There are no rules to what you do to get your cut back. Well, San Jose Steve Ruiz... He ran to the vehicle, got himself his own little pow pow, came back over, and he popped Mr. 187. Now, by the time the police had actually gotten to the scene, everything was gone. Everything was tampered with. Literally, all they had was watered down blood because they had taken the ice out of the coolers and tried to wash the pool away and picked up all of the shells. Now, Tossin's brothers, they rushed him to the hospital where he later succumbed to his wounds. Now, because nobody was willing to talk about what had happened, it left the cops chasing shadows. They know something happened. They can clearly see that there was a scene that had been tampered with. What are they going to do? The cops feared that whoever had shot Mr. 187 was actually killed themselves. And that somehow, in the middle of all of this, that the Hells Angels had disposed of whoever that is somehow. 
Now, fearing that the Hells Angels had actually banded together to ruin this crime scene and get rid of all of the evidence, the cops did the unthinkable. They went to Jethro's grave after everybody had left. They dug up his coffin and opened it to make sure that there was not a dead body in there with him. Now, Ruiz had been smuggled out by his brothers. They can't be mad at him. He did what he had to to get his cut back. It is what it is. He's obviously going to be out of the club. That's, that's a fact. But they never put a hit out on Ruiz. San Jose Steve, they never went hunting for him for what happened in the cemetery. He was just out of the club. No real Hells Angel, as much as they love Jethro and as much as they love Mr. 187, is willing to sit there and say, San Jose Steve did what he had to do under the circumstances he was dealt. Now, after finding out that some of the employees in the cemetery had videotaped the incident, the police quickly keyed in on is San Jose Steve Ruiz they're looking for. It took them months. Finally, I don't know if they got a tip. They never really said. Information led them to a motel in Fremont, California. So they surround the place. They go into the office. They call them on the phone. We got your place surrounded. Might as well come out. Eventually, San Jose Steve surrenders to the police. Now, San Jose Steven Ruiz, he actually took the plea deal with the quickness. That dude, like on his preliminary, was already looking and getting that deal. He went from facing a life sentence to doing three years, eight months for voluntary manslaughter and carrying a concealed weapon. Now, he didn't have to roll. I didn't find anything saying that he rolled, gave the cops anything. Basically, he, he had a self-defense case. I think the DA probably knew that and they thought maybe his own brothers will take care of him while he's in there. Well, that's not how that works. Even though he did do what he did to another brother, everybody saw the reason why he did it. Nobody was going to come at, at San Jose Steve and say, hey man, we're coming for you. They just said, have a good life. You're no longer a hell's angel. So end of story, right? The club shoot it out. Romeo gets life. Steve Tawson, Mr. 187, killed at the funeral. Now nah, this ain't the end. We got more. In 2016, due to improper jury instructions, the Nevada Supreme Court overturned Romeo's conviction. Now, Romeo's out of prison, but he's not going too far. He's back in the Washoe County Jail, fighting the same case again. Then 2017 comes along. The feds say, hey, it's better if we have Romeo and everybody involved in the Sparks conspiracy all together in this new little Rico that we're about to go after the Vagos with. That way, when we charge these 23 Vagos members, we can charge all of them with the murder because it's a Rico. So that's what the feds did. They took the eight Vagos that were involved in the Sparks incident and they rolled them into a 23 man indictment and gave them all 12 counts apiece. But now all 23 of those men, no matter if they were just dealing dope, now they're charged with murder in a RICO. Now here's the big thing. All 23 of these men, and we're talking the top dogs of the Vagos, they kept it so strong. Not one of them flipped. Now I'll end up doing a whole story on that entire indictment. But for now, we're just going to talk about the men that were involved in the Sparks incident at least in the eyes of the law and in the eyes of the feds for this RICO case. And those men were International Vagos President, Pastor Tata Palafox, Nicaragua Chapter President, Ernesto Romeo Gonzalez, the man who was convicted before of killing Jethro, International Vagos Officer Albert Al Lopez, International Vagos Nomad President, Albert Dragon Man Perez, Veteran Vagos member James Jimbo Gillespie, Vagos member Bradley Candyman Campos, Vagos member Cesar C. Morales, and last and not least, Diego Boo Garcia, the poor dude who caught lead from Jethro. So the reason they were able to get such high hanging fruit when it came to the Vagos tree is because Jabbers had testified it was a hit. It was an orchestrated hit that came from the very top, Tata and Dragon Man called this hit that day. Well, Jabbers, he was back. He was back to testify in this case also. Only problem is Jabbers got on the stand, looked at the jury 
and said that he had lied in the original case. He told the jury in front of the whole court that he had lied and made that story up. He had gotten immunity. Well, what he thought was immunity, he was supposed to get two years probation. He ended up getting two to seven years in prison on, on a stacked sentence. Either he lied in the first case or he lied in the second one. Either way it goes, Jabbers is a liar. Now the prosecutors, of course, they try to distance themselves from Jabbers, but you can't. You can't distance yourself from the only person that puts this conspiracy together. Him and one other Vago are the only two that said, hey, this was a conspiracy. Now both of them are getting on the stand and testifying that they lied. You think the feds cared? No, they moved right on, right along with the same trial. Tried it just the same as 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 if Jabbers had said that they, that they did it. So now you have two Vagos that had previously testified that it was a conspiracy and an orchestrated hit. Now they're both on the stand saying it's not. Not just that, for the drug portion, the dope portion of all of this, they got an undercover detective who was actually patched into the Vagos. They got him to tell on the stand how he had fabricated evidence and charges against many of the Vagos, the 23 men that were facing this RICO. Like I said, I'm going to do a full video on that here probably pretty soon. But for now, let's keep it to the Sparks, Nevada. The government moves forward. They have a seven month long trial. Jabbers and the other Vago, they got on the stand two months into the trial and said that they had lied. That should have been the end of it right there. They should have dropped the charges, but no. The government with their 96.9 .9 conviction rate, they just couldn't take a little 1%. Mm-mm, no. If they'd have dropped the charges, they could have picked them up later too. That's the craziness of it. They sent this to the jury. The jury deliberated for about 17 hours over four days. They come back, what do you guys think happened? Any juror in their right mind is going to acquit the eight Vagos. That's exactly what happened. I know you probably thought I was about to say, no, they found him guilty. No, all eight of these men walked. When they were outside of the courthouse, one of the lawyers for one of the Vagos actually said, hey, this is what happens when the government puts their case together with tricks and liars. Now, Romeo, he's set free. The man was facing doing 28 to life got himself a retrial. The state did not pick it up because the feds did, and he beat that. He went from, I'm doing probably the rest of my life, I'll be out when I'm 83 years old, to now he's a free man. A few months after this, the government came forward and they dropped the charges against the other Vagos that were still ready to stand trial for their portion of this RICO. The original eight had just beat it. They knew our case is done. We're about to lose the ability to retry them or to basically if they drop the charges right now, they can pick the charges up later. If they're found not guilty, you can't ever pick those back up. So there you have it. There's the craziest story. We're talking shootouts in the middle of casinos. We're talking cops coming in on ATVs to stop it. We're talking the most popular Hells Angel president of his time shot down in the back in the middle of the casino floor by a rival's president. We're talking the, the rivals standing trial, standing tall, but one dude who started it all. Jabbers is a piece of garbage, and I'm just gonna go ahead and say that. The dude will probably beat me up if he meets me in real life, but check this out. All those bodies are on him. His friend getting 28 to life is on him. That whole fight, that was all on him. None of that had to happen but Jabbers couldn't check his ego. And then he tried to weasel his way out of it, finagled a deal, like this man is literally facing a life sentence because he did something in a fight that you started and now you're gonna tell on him? Yo, I must have missed that day of the game, bro. I don't understand it. Please don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button if you're not already subscribed. Show, show your boy a little bit of love. Also, you can go you can check out my playlist. My playlist, Vegas Prison Stories, has a ton of these good stories on it. Thank you for coming to Vegas Profile Stories. I appreciate each and every one of you. I hope you guys have an amazing day, and I'll see you next time.
This is who I was, but it's definitely not who I am.